Good evening. Good evening. What, what a pleasure to follow Dr. Angel. I think we agree on uh, a lot of this um, information. And I'm going to ask for quick help about how to advance my slides, because I will use slides. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Thanks very much. Um, so I thought uh, I would spend my time this evening going through a little bit about healthcare for all. I'm assuming uh, many of you do not know about um, my organization. I want to talk some about Massachusetts health reform, what the history was, what it looks like, and then um, I uh, will, am always delighted to um, do what uh, Professors Arbat and Parmet have asked, and so Wendy was specifically asking about what the current um, circumstances look like with the Affordable Care Act. So I wanted to talk about some about that, kind of digging into some of the um, headlines that Dr. Angel was talking about. Then think about the next 10 years, and then finally um, looking at what I hope will uh, be our experience uh, tw uh, 10 years after that, so 20 years from now. And then I'm gonna talk about how you can get involved and realize the next phase of health reform. So Healthcare for All is a 30-year-old nonprofit organization. We are a 501c3 that has worked hard to represent the voice of patients <coughs> and consumers in Massachusetts and to push for patient-centered changes in our healthcare delivery system. We do our work by engaging patients and um, healthcare consumers across Massachusetts. We are engaged in grassroots, outreach, education, um, and we also provide direct service through our helpline. We have an 800 number. Anybody in Massachusetts is welcome to call to navigate any kind of glitch that they have in um, their current healthcare experience. We are um, able to answer and respond to inquiries in English, Spanish, Portuguese, and Italian. And I'm always looking to be able to expand our language capacity because our mission at Healthcare for All is to create a more consumer-centered healthcare system that delivers high-quality, comprehensive, culturally competent care for everyone, and we pay attention to the most vulnerable among us. We have um, uh, folks, we have about uh, 30 employees who work directly on health policy, who engage coalitions, finding unlikely stakeholders, figuring out what is it that our payers, providers, and um, healthcare consumers have in common, and finding a common table to be able to drive reform from that point of strength. As I say, we also have this helpline. One of the incredible benefits of the helpline, not only is that we can provide direct service one-on-one -on -one as individuals call us to help us navigate a glitch, but that also informs our policy response. We understand what uh, is going on in implementation either of Massachusetts Health Reform or now uh, with Obamacare, and we can tailor our public policy response based on direct consumer uh, input. We do have this public education campaign going on. I'm gonna talk more about that. We literally are going door to door right now it, it, across the Commonwealth. We've targeted about 40,000 doors we've committed to knocking on to help people understand what health reform looks like, what they have to do to maintain their health care coverage, and if they don't have insurance, um, we continue to sign folks up. We appear at um, community fairs all across uh, Massachusetts. I'm getting increasingly uh, savvy about what it means when it is um, uh, uh, the, at the Brazilian <coughs> festival, what looks best, and how we can engage with um, targeted immigrant communities. And um, we're doing that four and five times a weekend. It's wonderful to hear um, how people are having conversations at these public <coughs> both health fairs and community fairs um, across Massachusetts. And then, as I say, patient uh, consumer empowerment is one of the hallmarks for what we do. So this is what passage of Chapter 58, Dr. Angel referred to, Massachusetts Health Reform. This was the signing ceremony. You'll notice a lot of people looking really similar in 2006. That is, of course, Governor Romney um, signing Chapter 58, which was our state's health reform bill. And this is what health reform looked like. This is, uh, these are the, the early results as measured in 2011 for uh, passing health reform in the Commonwealth. I, uh, I appreciate what Dr. Angel said about the fact that a whole lot of people hoped that we would be saving money in Massachusetts by passing health reform, 
Healthcare for All was not at all naive about the fact that we were going to be able to drive down costs. <laughs> what we wanted to do was get almost everybody insured, and we have succeeded in that um, effort. 400,000 new folks, or folks in Massachusetts, have health insurance because of the passage of Chapter 58. And um, you all probably experienced this yourselves, that health care uh, is wildly personal. They, for every one of those 400,000 people, there are potential stories about what it has meant to be connected to health insurance, what it has meant to be able to present and find a doctor and to begin a relationship with a health care system that might otherwise have been impossible. Um, one of the things that we learned in uh, implementing Chapter 58 is it took a tremendous amount of effort and very intentional, um, a, an intentional strategy to spread out across Massachusetts to engage different stakeholders and to communicate in lots of ways. Um, if those of you who were here in 2006 may remember that the Red Sox engaged in part of the public education. We were very clear that getting the word out about what was going to be required to be uh, in compliance with this law, what it was going to take to sign up for health insurance for some people who never in their lives had had um, health care coverage before and what it would mean to actually exercise um, the benefits that you acquired uh, after signing up for insurance would take time and effort. And these are just snippets from the, um, the advertising campaign. And as I say, there were foundations that stepped up to fund some of this uh, information and education. And part of the reason uh, we were able to sign 400,000 people up pretty efficiently was because we really uh, reached out across the state. One of the lessons that we learned was that Healthcare for All absolutely needed regional partners. We, we are a statewide organization, but in fact, our resources limited our ability to reach to all corners of the Commonwealth. And so we partnered with uh, regional organizations that were trusted members of their communities um, to try to uh, educate and make sense in um, paying attention to local priorities. And this is um, one of my favorite, of those of you who are community organizers, this is, should be a very familiar graphic that frankly, when you are trying to do go at things piecemeal, you will not have, um, you, you'll be swallowed up and you'll lose the effort. I, I, I will say right now, it's feeling a little bit like the top graphic describes implementation of the Affordable Care Act. The bottom graphic is um, what we felt like we were able to achieve in implementing Chapter 58, which was getting folks on the same page, understand the benefits that were available to them, and um, uh, providing people the opportunity to actually engage um, and get healthcare coverage. So we're very proud of the fact that in Massachusetts we have the highest insured rate in the nation. There are uh, 96, I don't have the, the current today's statistics, but um, I'm happy to be corrected, that 96, almost 97% of adults in Massachusetts have health care coverage, and 99.6% of children in Massachusetts have health care coverage. And I will take some um, pride in the fact that health care for all engaged very quickly in trying to find as many children as we possibly could to sign them up for coverage. It is wonderful, incredible news to parents when you can explain that there are subsidies available to get health insurance for their kids. Um, and so right now there are about 3,000 uninsured children in Massachusetts, and we are determined to find every single one of them and get them signed up. Uh, it also has made a tremendous difference. Uh, we'll get to the Affordable Care Act, but uh, the ability for young people to stay on their uh, parents' health insurance coverage through the age of 26 has made uh, a tremendous difference. So, I assume this is not news for you either. How's the Affordable Care Act going? How's the implementation going? Good grief, it appears to be a train wreck. Um, horrible headlines, horrible stories of woe and doom and gloom. And again, for those of us in Massachusetts who take some pride in the fact that it is in fact built on what we've done here, um, have been very frustrated with the lack of focus on some of the benefits that have been coming, um, certainly here in Massachusetts. And to put it in perspective, this is one of my, one of my, more, uh, one of my favorite Robin Reagan quotes, who simply predicted social, uh, the decline of uh, the country as we know it. And in fact, he was talking about Medicare. And we know that in, 
this many years out, we couldn't do without Medicare. Uh, and I would absolutely agree, it's not at all perfect, but boy, it makes a huge difference for um, our seniors and those with disabilities who qualify for it. So the ACA has been off to a rocky start, and one of the things that has been, as I say, uh, frustrating has been trying to get news out to people about what this was going to mean in Massachusetts. So it is built on the Massachusetts model. Um, Dr. Angel, I think, did a wonderful job talking about some of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act. Um, there were benefits that came to Massachusetts. There were parts of the ACA that uh, were included that we weren't able to win, actually, in 2006. One of the benefits that will uh, has been addressed in uh, the national health reform law is that folks who make between 300 and 400 percent of the federal poverty level actually qualify for subsidies. On Healthcare for All's helpline, one of the hardest calls we get, and we get these frequently, um, are from people, calls from people who are really just having a very difficult time to pay for insurance. They are folks making between 300 and 400 percent of the federal poverty level and it is not affordable for them. So there is a whole appeals process so that um, folks don't have to pay the fee for being uninsured, but the fact that it's about 36,000 people in Massachusetts will get um, tax benefits because <coughs> of this income gap, that will be new to folks. Closing the donut hole also is good news in Massachusetts <coughs> that the, this ridiculous um, requirement for prescription drug coverage payments uh, under Medicare uh, that is good news for our seniors as well, and um, you may or may not remember that there were rebate checks that were sent out that actually, um, I, I think, got people's attention. Since then, however, um, the news has been all about the website, and frankly, as an advocate who is trying to improve the system as it currently exists, having to spend a lot of time talking to people about the fact that, you know, health reform is and your health is more than a website got pretty tiresome because if you were one of the people, by a show of hands, did anybody try to go on the website and sign up for insurance? I'm just gonna, one, I look forward to hearing how that went. I, I will hope that's because lots of you have it. I actually went on the website at 12.01, uh, the day the exchange opened, thinking that I wanted to sign somebody else up actually and see what the experience was. <clears throat> An 18 hour hold, 18 hours. Um, and then it was a silly, silly disconnect. So. Again, I can't, and I, this was somebody who wasn't going to be able to have insurance until January anyway, and so I was just doing it as a test. But if you are somebody who is sick and uh, dependent on and thinking that this is, uh, you are looking forward to the day you can get insurance, what a horrible experience. So, um, absolutely the website is not at all what we hoped it would be. There is some good news. If you read the paper this morning, you saw that. More people signed up uh, Sunday and Monday for insurance than did all through the month of October and November. Um, so the glitches have been cleared. More work to be done, and again, it will still not be a flawless, um, uh, flawless experience, but it is a game changer, I think. Uh, and we're fairly excited about what it will mean. So. You have experienced this, you know, people trying to explain the Affordable Care Act and trying to do it in bite-sized, easy, easily digestible uh, chunks. Stuff gets lost in translation. The most glaring, obvious example is the often replayed and repeated uh, quote of President, or, or a clip of President Obama saying, if you like your insurance, you can keep it. You know, the caveat to that is so complicated and so long, and I would love to think that because we live in Massachusetts and we are um, fairly educated healthcare consumers, you know that the plans had to meet a particular standard. There had to be particular benefits included, and if those benefits weren't included, that insurance wasn't going to qualify under the Affordable Care Act. So there's been an awful lot of press coverage, and understandably, uh, there's been a lot of confusion and frustration from consumers who are trying to understand what this means. And at Healthcare for All, we've spent a lot of time trying to help people navigate the disconnect with their primary care provider. We care desperately about continuity of care. You know, imagine if you were fortunate enough to have somebody like Dr. Angel as your primary care doc. You don't want to lose access to her because your plan is going to change. So we've spent quite a lot of time thinking about how to make sure um, people's actual health status comes into play 
uh, in addition to uh, making sure that their coverage is robust. Again, in trying to explain what the truth is about implementation of the Affordable Care Act, helping people understand that having uh, health insurance that doesn't really meet uh, the minimum benefits package uh, is like walking around with car insurance or driving around with car insurance that doesn't cover collision. It's actually important that you have benefits that will mean something to you. And um, uh, that takes a little time to get to and is much harder to try to explain than just, you know, I lost my health insurance and you said I wouldn't. So one of the things that we learned in implementing uh, Chapter 58, Massachusetts Health Reform, is communication and a media campaign is incredibly important. And it requires not just commercial advertising and letters to the editor and, um, and using all traditional communications tools, it truly takes this one-on-one, face-to-face -on -one, communication. Because as I say, and as I imagine you know personally, it is, you want to know about your plan. You, you know, that's fine, national policy, that is all super interesting for people who care about policy. But what you want to know is, what is this going to mean to you personally? Is it going to mean more money out of pocket? Is it going to mean that you're going to have access to different benefits? So this house-to-house -house canvas has been invaluable, and it's underway now, and Healthcare for All is learning a tremendous amount about what people are worried about, what is, um, what is complicated and confusing for people. Um, as of today, as I say, there is this wonderful statistic that's being bantied about. I, I don't have the number of people who signed up, but uh, 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 Sunday and Monday were banner days for healthcare.gov. Uh, we're, we're interested in listening very carefully. The next, I think, um, the next headline I'm looking for is whether these signups are actually, uh, the information is actually getting to the insurance companies. Um, and in other words, is the back and function as robust and seamless as what the front now finally, finally looks like. Again, multiple approaches to being able to have a successful strategy in change. Change is complicated. Um, and it gets people quite worried. And I would say part of our work is uh, work together, making the Affordable Care Act. I, I am heavily invested in um, wanting the Affordable Care Act to succeed. And I do not share the pessimism that Dr. Angel suggested that we've only got a couple of years. We certainly have had setbacks. There are decisions that are being made in Washington that make us in the advocacy world to scratch our heads, this allowing employers to wait a little bit longer um, to offer coverage, that's a head scratcher, allowing um, non-compliant plans to continue to be sold for the next year, that is a national uh, conundrum, I think, and not a decision that we <laughs> was met with a whole lot of success here. In fact, in Massachusetts, um, the governor asked for guidance. What did, what did we in the um, consumer advocacy world think about the president's decision <coughs> to again let uh, non-compliant plans or plans with thin benefits continue to be sold? Um, and we asked that, the, that Massachusetts not allow that to happen. Again, in Massachusetts, since 2006, we've had a minimum benefits package referred to as a minimum creditable coverage and plans have and plans sold and policies sold in Massachusetts have had to be compliant with that benefit um, structure, and we didn't want to back away from that. It's an actually incredibly important, um, as I say, that people have buy policies that cover uh, services that they need and care about. So I, I believe we all have some work to do. Healthcare for all is uh, out in the world. I'm happy to give. Training sessions, we are training. Um, we've been in health centers and we've been in community centers, we've been in schools. We have been to um, community uh, meetings with uh, legislative legislators from across the Commonwealth who are trying to educate their constituents. And um, so far, it's just, it's been an incredibly rich and rewarding exercise for us as we are um, really cognizant of what folks are looking for out of their healthcare coverage. So, uh, all of that being said, I will say that um, this is not perfect. This is, we, I believe, have improved the system that we inherited. We have not fixed our system. And 
um, what we hear all the time is how expensive healthcare coverage still is. Um, and how uh, people are still having to do trade-offs between you know, the life's necessities of rent and food and picking up prescription drugs or um, going to see their doc. And it's, it's vitally important that we figure out the cost conundrum. Um, and I'm positive Dr. Angel and I would agree with some of the real um, stumbling blocks and hurdles that are gonna have to be surmounted to be able to really attack cost. But here, here are uh, a few things that I think are hopeful, that offer an opportunity to change the current uh, power dynamic that is the bedrock of our current healthcare system. Again, more and more people are talking about their out-of-pocket costs for healthcare coverage and what it's meaning. There is, uh, I would absolutely agree that even as people have coverage, there is this really unpleasant cost shift going on uh, for individuals. As an employer, I also have just been through the exercise of buying our health insurance for our 30 employees, and uh, it was just astonishing the difference. Here in Massachusetts, we have the luxury of, I, I have many health plans to choose from uh, as an employer, and I appreciate that very much. I also know there are jurisdictions across the country that don't have the, um, the wealth of uh, differences of different plans and, and carriers that we have. But boy, there were some very frustrating uh, new costs in our plan, and it took some real um, juggling to figure out how we would not. Uh, uh, we actually changed carriers, and um, we saved money, and because we're healthcare for all, we pass the savings on, shared savings, we're all about shared savings, pass it on to the employees, so they will actually pay a little bit less. And, um, but that took a ton of negotiation, and I am not naive enough to think that uh, every individual or company has the time and um, the brain trust to be able to go and sit with brokers or with um, uh, contract officers to be able to lower their healthcare costs. But uh, we did have that experience, and uh, I now aspire to have other companies be able to have the exact same experience. The digital age and the global economy, I think, shows great promise as people become more aware of other healthcare systems, of other international um, healthcare experiences. I think more and more I'm hearing about people who have traveled and had a, um, a run-in with a healthcare system. And you know, my favorite is uh, somebody who fell and broke her arm, was taken to an emergency room, cast, given a prescription and sent on her way, and no questions were asked. And the question was, why was that allowed to happen? And that is because it was, that is how that country rolls. Healthcare is not um, seen as uh, an added benefit, but it's human right. And uh, folks, when I have, an op I have opportunities to talk to folks in other healthcare systems. We had um, a delegation from France came over recently to find out what's going on in Massachusetts and what's going on with the Affordable Care Act uh, nationally. And when we were talking about medical debt and bankruptcy, I, I honestly got, they were journalists, we thought their heads were gonna explode because it had never occurred to them that you could actually have to lose your house to pay for healthcare. The more people can understand the trade-offs and what other systems look like, I think the more we can begin to demand um, better benefits and more reasonable costs from our current system. The other thing I'm talking about is the next generation of medical professionals. I am a humongous fan of the American uh, Medical Students Association. Those folks are really asking for demanding to be able to practice medicine one-on-one uh, -on -one with patients in a way that I think a uh, generation or two ahead of them has not had the luxury of doing. They are our biggest advocates on cutting down on things like um, gifts from pharmaceutical industries to professionals. They are just marvelous um, colleagues with individual uh, patients and consumers. So I have great expectations for you know, more doctors like Dr. Angel being able to look at the current system and say, this isn't right. Um, so in the next 10 years, this is my, uh, my slightly foggy crystal ball, there are going to be some things that get worked out. The um, push in Massachusetts for global payments kind of returning to, uh, well, the undoing some of the um, peculiar incentives that come from fee-for-service medicine 
um, that you heard about earlier, you know, more tests, more money, not necessarily uh, the right tests and certainly no incentives yet for keeping people healthy. I think some of that will be worked out. We're concerned in, uh, at Healthcare for All, we're excited about the possibility for global payments and I don't know if you all are familiar with what that term means, but having basically a budget for your healthcare that you pay in that follows you, that encourages you to see your primary care provider that um, allows you to have healthcare in a more integrated, you'll have a more integrated healthcare experience. I love talking about that. I love talking about what the benefits are of having nurses come to your home and it's not clear, or having a nurse educator or somebody come to talk to you about how to manage your chronic disease. We know that's an incredibly effective intervention. We can't figure out, I, it's not clear to me, It'll be, we'll know in the next 10 years, how does that get paid for? Is that part of your global payment? Where is the incentive? Um, and how do you stay accountable? I think some of that will be figured out. Risk corridors uh, and readings is a really wonky set of things uh, to discuss about how you decide how much should be part of somebody's global payment and budget. I uh, have great faith that that will be worked out and I think we will be able to be, uh, we'll adopt and be more comfortable with evidence-based medicine. I um, do not often count myself as naive. I am almost always opti optimistic, but the derailment of the conversation about evidence-based medicine as we were navigating the passage of the Affordable Care Act as actually leading to death panels, I didn't understand. I, that just caught me flat-footed completely. So I think there will begin to be, certainly in the next 10 years, as we're beginning to understand that certain courses of treatment are better, uh, for managing certain diseases, have better outcomes, um, I think will help make um, courses of treatment more routine for different things than we currently have. I also think there will be uh, uh, a better appreciation for the benefits that come from shared decision making. Uh, shared decision making, I think, is an incredibly powerful tool that is currently underutilized, but basically means your course of treatment for whatever your uh, disease or diagnosis <coughs> is uh, will be based on both what your medical professional advises, but also what you personally, what reflects your priorities for your care. I think that will make a huge difference. And all of this um, is uh, made better by the strength of a committed consumer movement. And that's exactly what um, Healthcare for All is about. Engaging consumers, helping providers, helping payers understand what our priorities are, and then uh, uh, asking sometimes with great force and authority, sometimes asking up in the halls of the state house to pass uh, legislation and regulations that <coughs> reflect our priorities. So here's my concern about uh, what might happen in the next decade, that this current market um, consolidation is going to continue. And again, I, I can't say right now whether that is a good or a bad thing. I am interested in the different players talking about uh, the fact that they have to gobble up more hospitals. You know, we need to be, we can better serve the patients if we are one giant system. Um, and I'm interested to understand if that means fewer barriers for patients. So every time there's one of these hospital takeovers or, you know, we had a conversion of a nonprofit hospital system to a for-profit hospital system, that was an enormous <coughs> shift in our market in uh, Massachusetts. And the jury is still out on whether that has been good or uh, what the impact has been on health outcomes. And part of Healthcare for All's role is to say, actually, the health outcomes is the sign of success, not whether there are, is more money to shed for uh, investors and stockholders, but in fact, are the patients who continue in that system healthier? Are they, uh, do they have better access, more patient-centered care than they did three years ago? Again, jury's still out. Uh, boutique care for different populations. I think um, concierge medicine is something that troubles me terribly. I don't know if it's anything on your radar screen. It is a workaround for people who can afford it. And I uh, am troubled about what it means for folks who are never going to be able to afford it and uh, whether they'll have access to what I think people are paying for truly is the relationship and access to their providers. And then more IT it stands, uh, I, I think there's great potential with sharing uh, information and health 
information and being connected to our providers in a way that we aren't currently. So that's in the next 10 years. From 23 to 2033 is really fun to think about. Um, and uh, just exactly like Dr. Angel, I, th I think there are two very distinct paths that we can go down. You know, are we going to do what's going on now just on steroids? Are we going to have even fewer systems? Are we going to have even bigger companies um, invested in, frankly, not keeping us healthy? If the current system values us being ill, um, or are there going to be um, uh, bigger disparities between folks who can buy into the system or not buy into the system? Um, uh, are we going to continue to think about individual health and not necessarily value population health? Um, you will not at all be surprised to know that is not my preference. My hope is that we begin to really pay for and value um, patient experience, patient outcomes, health outcomes, and we talk about and value population health. Um, frankly, one of the um, wonderful things that uh, uh, Professor Auerbach did as Commissioner of Public Health in Massachusetts was to champion a public health trust, the first in the nation, actually. We have money set aside in our state budget to invest in population health, and these are um, quick and effective grants that can be made at the local level to um, enhance and evaluate uh, public health strategies to see what's working. And then we want to be able to replicate them all across Massachusetts. There's a tremendous amount of attention being paid about whether this particular investment is going to drive the kind of change and health improvement that we expect it to. Um, and again, I always uh, have the pleasure of talking about um, Professor Auerbach's role in championing that, um, that fund. Um, in the future, 20 years from now, I hope that these acute episodes showing up in the emergency room is viewed as a failure of about 14 other steps that could have been taken. You know, right now, emergency room care is highly valued. It's the most expensive care in our system. It is, from a patient's perspective, um, tremendously frustrating that what happens to you in the ER doesn't necessarily translate back into your uh, health record with your primary care doc. That's a missed, um, uh, that's a lack of continuity that I think begins to cost us. I cannot tell you, and I assume you all have the same experiences, I can't tell you the number of times I've heard about tests that have been duplicated ba once in the emergency room and then again replicated when you get back to your primary care or back to your um, medical home because they don't have access to the medical record. It's, a, it's an IT glitch. It also puts the burden on um, you or your loved one to be your best health reporter. I, I consider myself pretty talented at being a health reporter, and frankly, there's no way I can provide that kind of accurate reporting back to uh, my primary care provider, and I don't think that um, consumers and patients should be expected to. Um, in the improved delivery system, uh, I believe there will be, and there, we're beginning to have an appreciation for investment in prevention that um, preventing illness is always less expensive than treating acute episodes. Um, there are quality of life issues involved. There are um, longevity issues involved. It, it is just makes good common sense to invest in uh, prevention strategies. And I, I believe, as I say, we are beginning to turn the corner on um, understanding how vital that is to having a, a, a vibrant and um, effective healthcare system. I, I've talked a little bit, alluded to what it looks like to have care delivered closer to patients. Um, I think we experience that currently in uh, the hospice care model. Hospice is um, based on keeping folks at home. There are also um, some other aging strategies where keeping people in the community and um, having as uh, robust a life as possible given their um, health limitations has been valued and paid for, I think there's an opportunity to expand some of that so that, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by these, uh, by clinics showing up in pharmacies, by being able to get your flu shot. I saw somebody, 
you could get a flu shot. Um, it, it was not at a big chain pharmacy drugstore, but uh, it was something else that I had nothing to do with health. But again, it's a preventative strategy. It keeps you healthy, and frankly, it was convenient for folks. So, um, and I was just told about, this was in Seattle, that there's a drive-by flu shot clinic. You literally get your Starbucks, roll down your uh, um, window, stick your arm out, and get your flu shot. Again, um, I don't know that that's the solution to anything. I'm fascinated by that being really convenient for consumers. Uh, I think a whole lot of people have said really smart and interesting things about telemedicine. Um, I, as an advocate for a vulnerable people, am clear that actually not everybody has Wi-Fi at home, but um, we are finding increasingly the use of smartphones uh, is uh, endemic and I believe provides a way to communicate with patients that we don't currently, I know some plans take advantage of, some providers take advantage of. I think there's a lot more to be said about that and about what um, that common experience uh, is for people. So we do have lots of opportunities to improve. Um, one of the things that we have underway in Massachusetts and that is the, um, Corollary, the next step to help refer to Chapter 58 in Massachusetts, is we passed something called Chapter 224, which is specifically at pay, uh, uh, drives payment reform and health system delivery reform. Um, I've talked a couple of times about um, valuing overall health, and um, payment reform has some wonderful language. The payment reform legislation has some wonderful language in it that values and um, uh, aspires to have greater payments go to providers who deliver patient-centered care. Um, as a consumer advocate, I think it's really important, and I spent a lot of time talking about it's actually in the best interest of providers and payers to find out what the patient experience is. Um, and we currently do measure uh, patient experience, but I think we're not yet getting to the level of detail that is important that talks about overall health. You know, you, you, if you've had a doctor's appointment, you may have been, uh, you may have received a survey. Pay attention to what's being asked on those surveys because th those are metrics that are gonna be measured and addressed in the healthcare setting, setting you've um, visited. I was um, moderately cranky and did not keep it to myself when my survey came and I was asked about the cleanliness of the waiting room and the friendliness of the receptionist. So those are two super fabulous things, but what I really want to talk about is how long I had with my provider, whether she answered all the questions that I had, whether the information I left with resonated and made it possible for me to be compliant with whatever uh, treatment plan we had worked out together, and that is not yet being measured. In the world of payment reform, and 20 years from now, I hope uh, my provider who may only see me once to figure out that I have the flu and gives me you know, good information about how to go manage the flu and I leave uh, and don't come back for a repeated test. Now if I come back for a repeated test, she's paid every time I come back. In uh, the world 30 or 20 years from now, I hope she's paid, she gets as much money for getting me well and out the door in one visit with good information, has spent good time, uh, good quality time, again, based on my feedback as the patient. Um, that is currently uh, uh, revolutionary, but I have great faith and expectations that we can move closer to um, that as a reality for everybody. I think we're getting smarter about wellness. Um, I, I worry about um, current conversations with uh, insurers who uh, often challenge me and say, you know, smokers should pay more. Everybody knows smoking is really bad for you. So why aren't we charging smokers higher premiums? In Massachusetts, you cannot do that. I believe under Obamacare, um, I don't believe that's a risk factor that is uh, counted toward your premium. The answer in my mind is frankly, yeah, I don't want anybody to smoke. However, smoking cessation strategies are actually effective. And part of insurance is pooling our resources for sick people. Uh, you know, right now, uh, I am paying more into, my, into the healthcare system than I'm costing the healthcare system. That's just how it goes. At some point, when I'm older or something happens, I will actually be paying less into the healthcare system than is required to take care of me. Um, and that is the theory behind insurance and pooling. So 
I believe as we get smarter about wellness and about how to have uh, a, an environment that makes healthy choices easier, people will be able to be healthier. And I, I want the healthcare system to be part of that solution. Um, the other thing is uh, the campaign for cost. You know, there's a whole lot of conversation now about knowing what a procedure costs before you go in and sign up for it. It's really exciting, actually, and I think is part of consumer empowerment. It also really throws providers for a loop. And um, one of my favorite anecdotes that came into uh, Healthcare for All, this woman needed a knee replacement. She wanted to be a wildly responsible and informed consumer and shopper. She actually had, um, I think it was four or five different providers of, the, of knee replacement surgery were included and covered by her health insurance. That's not always the case, as you probably know. So she called all of them. And <laughs> she got wildly differing, um, wildly differing price uh, quotes, as you can imagine. But my favorite was the provider that could not, the system that could not tell her how much her knee surgery was going to be because they didn't know which anesthesiologist was going to administer the anesthesia. We just, it cannot be, that is, um, that sort of opaque black box uh, accounting that's going on makes it impossible for us to have the information that we need. As a consumer advocate, the information that I think is most critically important Maybe the um, hospital that costs a little bit more actually has better outcomes than the hospital that costs a little bit less. Or maybe, in fact, the lowest cost hospital has folks up and walking and not returning with an infection, you know, at a higher percentage than the hospital that costs more. That's the information that I think we have to have, which is outcome based. Where will, are you most likely and for how much money are you most likely to have a good outcome um, for whatever the procedure is that you are depending on. So the navigating uh, from what I believe is the potential future for the healthcare system with um, incredibly integrated <coughs> care, with a value placed on shared decision making. Um, with primary care at the you in the center of your healthcare system and uh, primary care your closest healthcare relationship, there are several things that make me hopeful for the um, outcomes in uh, 2023. First of all, again, I am um, I am so delighted to be doing this work in Massachusetts because truly now that almost everybody's covered, not everybody, but almost everybody's covered. We can, as a state, attack the issues of cost and quality of care. Um, and we have set the groundwork to do some of that work with passage of Chapter 224. There are also healthcare pilots underway across the state. There are wonderfully innovative um, insurance programs being set up so that uh, folks are. Uh, there, there's one program in particular that I know of that doesn't even have a standard benefits package. The checkbook really goes to the case manager and the patient is, they provide whatever the patient needs the, uh, based on the patient's health, health outcomes. So we know examples in this particular um, organization of a patient who had chronic asthma. So uh, a health educator went to the patient's home and found that there's tremendous dander in the house. The patient was given a new mattress and a, um, a recirculating air purifying fan and has cut down on his emergency room visits by almost two thirds. So while those are, imagine would your insurance company go buy you a mattress or a fan? Uh, it, probably not, but the fact is it saved, it saved the um, payer a tremendous amount of money. And again, from Healthcare for All's perspective, kept the patient home and healthy from having uh, and, and prevented additional asthma attacks. Um, we value uh, consumer stories and um, spend a lot of time helping people understand, again, very complicated policy issues based on individual experiences. We believe um, that consumer knowledge is power. We think that um, there's a whole lot of grumbling and kind of hand-wringing about uh, this request for price lists. You know, all of we, part of Chapter 224 requires that um, every insurer in the Commonwealth have a, 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 an online tool so that people can assess their upfront costs and their out-of-pocket expenses before they go and 
had a procedure, and um, this morning I was told by one of the biggest insurers in the state, uh, it'll be ready sometime. But it, they're all having the same interesting IT glitches that uh, we've certainly had uh, lots of reports about at the national level. I believe, and perhaps it is my um, never-ending optimism, that there is beginning to be an appreciation for the fact that we are over-medicalizing kind of life experiences. I have heard very interesting, read very interesting studies about the number of um, cesarean sections that are done in Massachusetts. Um, and uh, it's always interesting to ask uh, different perspectives why that is. I don't think um, it's because more and more women are saying they would like to have major surgery to have a baby. I think there are other forces at play. It is a highly reimbursed service, whereas a vaginal delivery is not uh, as highly reimbursed. Whether that is the driving factor, again, healthcare is wildly personal, so I'm sure there are lots of other reasons that go into that statistic, but I think it's important for us to pay attention to kind of the medicalization of these life events. Uh, uh, both life and um, uh, birth and death, I think, have become medical episodes, and uh, it's taken away some of the um, uh, some of the grace that can happen at both, at both ends of the uh, life spectrum. So no matter what we end up with uh, going forward, um, it will be a balancing act. I, I think we've seen this now, making sure people have access to the healthcare system, um, making sure that we pay attention to costs so that uh, care is not um, priced out of, uh, out of the realm of possibility for people and that we pay attention to what we're paying for so that it is quality care. One of the revolutionary things we did in Massachusetts that I know has had a, a direct <coughs> effect on cost and has now been echoed across the country is we don't pay for, we pay reduced amounts for preventable readmissions. So if you think about it, and if you know folks in your lives who have been discharged from the hospital and have had to go right back in, uh, either because of something that hadn't been finished, some treatment. Um, I, I, I have just navigated a problem with somebody who was hospitalized for 10 days with um, pneumonia, very serious pneumonia, and um, was discharged. Again, 10 days is a long hospital stay, um, but had to come right back in because she uh, began, she was not finished. Um, uh, she, she still was suffering from pneumonia when she checked out and went right back in through the emergency room. So here's how you can be part of this. Um, I absolutely invite you to become an empowered consumer and a, an informed advocate for your own health. And if you are interested in being engaged in this as a movement, please come join Healthcare for All. Um, I have information about what we do and about how to get engaged and follow the work that we do. Um, and uh, we are always looking for new members, and it's the holiday season, so we're delighted to have new members join us uh, as part of um, our build-up for what we're going to do in the new year. We would love to have you be part of it. And then there is a wonderful event that happens April 2nd, which I'm sure if your students feels like a lifetime from now, but for us it's going to happen in the blink of an eye. Um, one of the really smart things that Healthcare for All did is we honored Commissioner Auerbach for his public service a couple of years ago. It was a very fun event. So um, I'm happy to talk more about that at some point as well. So that is it. Thank you so much to both of our speakers. There's a lot. We only have a few minutes for questions. And I hope there's a lot to think about as you heard about the present and the future of the healthcare system. For 30, for just quickly before we go to questions and answers, uh, Joan Fitzgerald is going to briefly introduce next semester's open class. Okay, you can make your way up here while I while I'm talking. Yeah. Okay. So next semester, our topic is water, which you might think, boy, that's really narrow. Um, but when you add the subtitle "Challenges of Extremes," it gets pretty broad. So one of the things we know about climate change is dry places are going to get drier and wet places are going to get wetter. And it's going to get pretty ugly pretty quickly <coughs> over that. So the other thing you may not know is that Northeastern really is focusing on the issue of urban coastal zone management across our university. And I am just delighted that we have assembled the team that we have here 
for this topic. So we have Lee Breckenridge uh, from the School of Law. Brian Helmuth is going to be leading the, the open classroom. Brian is a marine biologist with a joint appointment in the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs. I've been engaged in this as well. Arup Ganguly, who is a professor of civil and environmental engineering, and we're delighted next semester to be announcing that we're partnering with the Museum of Science in delivering this. So along with the open classroom, we're going to have programming at the museum uh, connected uh, with, with the open classroom. So some of our topics, we're gonna start with storms. We know there's going to be more of them. Uh, water scarcity, um, agriculture, fisheries. What does this all mean for fisheries in Massachusetts and New England? The connection between water and energy. You may not know, but half of our end water in, is used to produce energy. What does it mean with fracking? So water security. So lots of really interesting topics. Uh, I hope to have everyone come back next semester. <laughs>